All right. Now, either the first service is an older crowd or they just know more about movies than y'all. Because, like, the minute we showed that, like, opening clip, first service, like, started dying laughing. So um, if you haven't seen that movie, spoiler alert, um, that is, of course, a classic scene from National Lampoon's Vacation. If you're familiar with that movie, you know it is about the Griswold family and their quest to get to Wally World. They spent the whole movie trying to get there only to arrive and find out that it is closed. And while we maybe not have taken cross-country trips to get to a theme park that's closed, uh, I just took a road trip to Tennessee and experienced something that I'm sure all of you have experienced from time to time, right? So uh, from Tennessee, or from St. Louis to Chattanooga is about seven and a half hours. We got kids and a dog. It becomes eight and a half hours. So you're driving, it gets around lunchtime, and then all of a sudden, you know, everyone's starting to get a little restless. You're like, all right, Dad, let's stop and get some lunch. So you're like, all right, well, what are we going to eat? We act like there's even a debate in our household. We all know we're going to stop at Chick-fil-A because it's the only acceptable place to stop on a road trip. So what do we do? We start paying attention to what's around us. We get out the map. Uh, we start looking. Okay, it's, you know, 50 miles up on the right, the exit, you know. So I'm like, you'll be okay. We'll get there. Just hold on. So we find the exit, we pull off, we're excited, you, you get off, you come over the hill, the hill, you know, you crest it, you see the beautiful chicken sign right there welcoming you in, only to realize that it's Sunday, Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday. This happens so often that they had to start putting a, sign, putting a little thing on the sign saying we're closed on Sunday. What does that have to do with the Bible? What does that have to do with a sermon? Well, if you're with us this morning, we're winding down our sermon series called Religion Redefined. We're looking at Jesus' teachings in Matthew 5 through 7 as Jesus lays out what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God breaking, crashing into earth. What is it? And if you've been with us, especially the last couple of weeks, Matt's been walking us through here at the end of chapter 7. We're at the tail end of it. And Jesus ends his manifesto, he ends his sermon with three warnings. He gives us three warnings as we're making our way through life to let us know where we're heading. What's the destination? Where do we want to end up? And to recap really quick, right, he gives us three warnings. We've done two of them. The first one was the warning about the narrow gate, right? The gate's not super wide, it's narrow. You're going to have to want to get into this gate. You're not just going to glide on into it. The second one Matt talked about last week, that as we make our way through life, we have to pay attention to those who are guiding us, those who are leading us. Does their life, not their ministry success, but does their life nourish other people? Is it nourishing? Are people finding life because of this person or does their life produce crops of lies, immorality, greed? And this morning we get the final warning sign. Let's take a look at it. Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, where Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. Now, Jesus is doing something interesting in this final warning. What he does is he's going to paint a scene. He's going to describe a scene that's going to happen in the future. So he's kind of fast forwarding the timeline. And he's talking about the final day, right? He calls it on that day. On that day, there's a day that everyone is heading to. There's a day, even this creation, we're all heading towards this consummation moment where the kingdom of heaven is the reality for all of earth, right? Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And then he fast forwards to the day when it will be the reality for all of earth. And on that last day, there will be something called judgment. Jesus says, on that day. Now, this is a day that's talked about a lot in the Bible. And in particular, it's talked about in Revelation chapter 21. So what I want to do for the next few moments is fill in a few gaps of what it's going to look like on that day by looking at 
Revelation 21, and Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 7. So flip real quick to Revelation chapter 21. This is on that day, as Jesus says. Revelation 21, verse 1 through 3 says, I and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be there with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. Now that is an incredibly breathtaking scene. It's a beautiful scene. It's a scene that I preach every time I have to do a funeral. That's what I talk about. It's given me a lot of encouragement in life as we walk through difficult things. I mean, it's a beautiful passage. But if you continue reading about that day, as beautiful as that is, there's something else that happens. If you go down to verse 7, it says this, Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with sulfur, fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That is a challenging passage. That's very challenging. And what's even maybe a little more unsettling is when we combine that with our passage this morning from the book of Matthew, as Jesus was talking about. You see, in the Revelation passage, it's easy to kind of distance ourselves from that, right? Well, I'm not a murderer. I don't think I'm polluted. I'm not a sorcerer. I don't go to the idolatry meeting. I'm not a liar. I mean, every now and then, but that's not kind of who I am, right? It's easy for us to separate ourselves from that. But Jesus' little detail makes it unsettling when he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? This is what Jesus is saying. On that day, there will be some who will be deceived into thinking that they're not part of the liars, the cowards, the faithless, the polluted. They're going to say, well, I'm not like these people. I did miracles in your name. I preached in your name. I drove out demons in your name. I mean, I'm one of your kids. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. That's one of the most terrifying verses in the Bible. But we got to remember, this is a warning. Jesus is giving us a warning. But what exactly is the warning, right? Matt talked about last week, right? Watch out. That's what Jesus is saying. These three things, watch out. Last week, Matt was saying, watch out for your leaders. Make sure that they're not deceivers, that they're not wolves in sheep clothing. This morning, what Jesus is saying is, watch out, but not for the deceiver out there. Watch out for the deceiver in here. Watch out for the deceiver in here. If you're a Christian in this room this morning, I've experienced some of this self-deception. You might be tempted by something that I call, and I have to watch out for myself all the time, something called ministry righteousness. What is that, you might be wondering? Well, I think that I can approach God because I do a lot of good stuff for him. Or I look at, the times I'm faithless, the times I'm a coward, the times I lie, and I go, yeah, that's bad, but, I mean, I'm preaching sermons on Sunday. I read my Bible. I I do all this other stuff. Surely this little thing over here isn't going to disqualify me from heaven. I'm okay. But I don't want to get to heaven I don't want to get to that day and say, Lord, didn't I do a lot of hospital visits in your name? Didn't I preach once a month at rooftop in your name? Didn't we plant a lot of churches in your name? Lord, I I give out my cell phone number, and if anybody needs to call me, I always take it, no matter what's going on. I did all that in your name. 
But that's for me. Those are kind of my ministry righteousness things that I hold up to God and say, well, this is why, you know, on that last day, you're going to let me in. I wonder, as you sit here this morning, what's your did I not? Little Lord, didn't I lead a small group, right? I had those people over to my house once a week for four years of my life. Lord, didn't I tithe? Didn't I give money and time and all these things to the church? Surely it won't be closed to me when I get there. Even scarier, though, than it just being closed, right? It being closed, but being sent to somewhere else. All right, you pull up to Chick-fil-A on a Sunday, it's closed. Well, I guess we're going to Panera now or somewhere else horrible like that. That was a Matt Herndon joke. But not just, oh, it's closed, but now I have to go somewhere else. I don't know about you, that's terrifying. <laughs> that, th- these verses, like, they, they make me feel uneasy. But if you're paying attention, and I hope you are, this is a good place to take a deep breath. This can be unsettling. And depending on how you grew up, you might feel really anxious right now, right? Maybe you grew up in a home where these kind of verses were like used as a weapon against you to control you and make sure you kind of fell in line. Maybe you're like, I love rooftop. I like when Matt preaches. This guy in the Providence thing telling me about missing heaven and I'm self-deceived. This is not fun. Is Matt going to get up there and take them out so we can get back to the better things? What's going on? As unsettling as these passages are, we have to engage with them because we don't want to be self-deceived. Jesus doesn't want us showing up on that last day and saying, yeah, I'm getting in because I did all this stuff. And him say, sorry, I never knew you. So let's move back from the future into the present. What What's Jesus saying right now is a warning that can keep me safe, that can keep me from having to avoid that challenging scene. Two things I think are clear in this passage. Number one, do the will of God. And number two, be known by God. Jesus says here that the kingdom of heaven is reserved for those who do the, do the Father's will. Let me read it again slowly to you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But, listen, only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, when I read that passage, two things happen in my brain. First, I just try to explain it away, right? You know, didn't Jesus, you know, wasn't he there for the Reformation, right? Didn't he read the latest Gospel Coalition article? Uh, The Gospel... Uh, salvation is a free gift of grace. I don't have to earn it. I don't really have to do anything. I just receive the gift, right? Like, so Jesus doesn't really mean that that's not really what he's trying to say, right? I try to negotiate it away. And especially as a pastor, right? I don't want people feeling like they got to earn their salvation and go out and try harder and do more. And, oh, Lord, how do I? It's just constant thing in my head. But there's this other voice that says, hey, Jesus said it. I want to take him at his word. What's it mean to do the will of God? This is a challenging topic, right? A lot of confusion around this. What's it mean to do God's will? Is it this thing that I have to do? It can get really overwhelming. But if you look at the Greek, if you really study, you really go to a seminary, it's taking a lot of hours, Doing the will of God means this, doing what God said to do. That's it. Doing what God said to do. It's looking at the Sermon on the Mount and not trying to explain it away, but saying, yes. Yes. This is the path of life. This is what I want to walk in. This is... The way, as Jesus said. That's the kingdom that's coming. In God's kingdom, uh, loving your enemies is the reality. Does that look appealing to you? 
Yes, Jesus wants us to do what he said. He wants us to obey. In fact, next week, he's going to say it even more explicitly. So join us next week to get part two. But doing the will of God means we get to come together as a church, as a group of people, not as individuals off doing our own thing, but coming together and say, what do the Beatitudes look like in 2022? What does loving and forgiving our enemies look like? What does God-focused prayer look like? And maybe that seems a little too community, lovey-dovey, can't really figure that out. Let me give you some explicit ones from the Bible. Listen to this one, 1 Thessalonians. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. So you're in high school, middle school, college, young adult, you're wondering, oh, what's God have for me? This, he wants you to be sanctified. That you should avoid sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Not in passionate lusts like the pagans who do not know God. Catch that? There's that knowing and doing thing again. And that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Like, that, that's your verse. Go do that. That's what Jesus wants you to do. Now, I didn't put that on the screen because I really want to focus on this next kind of, I think, explicit, do this. This is God's will from the Bible. Micah chapter 6, the prophet writes this. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with, a thou with thousands of rams, with tens and thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? That's, that, that, this guy doesn't want to miss out. He wants to know, what does God require of me? What does he want? Does he want me to come and worship and bring many gifts? Is he requiring me to give up my own firstborn to make atonement for my sins? Look at the next verse. He has told you, <laughs> O mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but? Full stop. Don't throw up the next slide. Don't yell the answer out loud. Can you answer what comes next? I, I say that in the most least judgmental. I had my own little moment with this passage. The least judgmental thing. Do you know what the Lord requires of you? Okay, how about this? Do you know what the Blues starting line is going to be next week? Can you name the starting projected infield for the Cardinals next season? Do you know all the Kardashian sisters by name? Do you know all Marvel movies, phases one through five, right? Do you know all the D&D &D classes, subclasses, you know, things like that, that I can just rattle off my head? But can I and can you name these things? Jesus, the, the prophet Micah is about to give us three things that God says is good and requires of you. This scared me this week. <laughs> I think about, think about this with my girls, my daughters, four and six. What am I going to tell them is the most important thing in life? Maybe what God requires of me is a pretty important thing. Am I going to, what am I going to be focused on? Is it going to be making sure that they get into the right school? They get good grades. They, they get on the right sports team. They have acceptable social lives. But how much time am I going to say, girls, do you know what God requires of you? If you really think about it, there's nothing more important than what comes after this. <laughs> and here's what they are. Do justice. Love kindness and walk humbly with your God. That's what the will of God is. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. I can't think of a better summary to the Sermon on the Mount other than maybe the book of James, <laughs> than this verse. This is what he is calling us to. 
Now, in case you might think this is just, uh, it's just okay, eh, is that really it? Like, did you just cherry pick this? You know, uh, is this how how important is this to God really? Um, let me read to you how important it is. Jesus is going to once again fill in the gaps a little bit with this on the last day thing. In Matthew chapter 25, I'm not going to put it on the screen because it's really long, but I want you to listen as I'm reading this. Jesus is he's going to continue to fill in what judgment looks like on the last day. This is what he says in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate people one from the other as a, sheep, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, that you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom provided for you from the foundation of the world. Well, that's a pretty awesome welcome in. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer. This is crazy. They're shocked. <laughs> well, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you in or naked and gave you clothing? When was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will look at them and say, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, right? The people who are deceived. He says, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they're shocked too. Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison or did not take care of you? And he will answer, I tell you just as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but to the righteous eternal life. Whew. It seems like this justice, loving kindness, mercy, they, these things are important to God. This is why... This is why the Christmas season is like a little bit more of a focus on what the other 11 months should be like. Christmas isn't like, the, well, you know, God, I hadn't really done anything. Let's go get a gift off the giving tree. Uh, this should just be our life, just a little bit more focused. This is why we go to Mexico to build homes. This is why every other Monday people go out and give backpacks and visit with homeless people. This is why we take care of care portal families and fostering faithful families. This is why we talk about justice issues with our learning community on race. Because these things aren't just add-ons like, oh, uh, maybe if we got time we should do these. This is the stuff. Jesus talks about this again with a group called the Pharisees in Matthew 23. Because here's the here's like the, the pastoral thing that's hard to navigate is Jesus isn't saying, do what the Pharisees do, just try harder than them. Just do more stuff than they did. He rebukes them because their focus is off. Listen to what he says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe, mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. It is these you ought to do have practiced without neglecting the others. Now, Jesus says earlier in the Sermon on the Mount that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Here's a heads up. No one tried harder than the Pharisees. <laughs> you, you, you can't try harder than them. What was off was their heart. What was off was their focus. You see, the people in our passage this morning, right? Lord, did we not um, preach sermons? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do miracles? 
The Pharisees in Matthew 23, Lord, didn't we, we tithe? We did their exact measurements on all this stuff. What is it that we're tempted to focus on and miss out? Is it winning elections or making sure the values that we, we agree with are represented here? Or what are those things that can be distracting? Because Jesus expects us to do what he said, but like I said, we can't do it better than the Pharisees did it. What he expects is not perfection. He knows we're not going to be perfect. And that's good news for people like you. That was good news for me this week. That God doesn't expect me to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with his God perfectly. I can say that because later, earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, what does he teach us to pray? Forgive us our sins. The narrow way of Jesus isn't for perfect people, right? That's the thing. The narrow way, it's not for people who are perfect. The narrow way of the Sermon on the Mount is not for perfect people. But the narrow way, albeit imperfectly, describes God's people. As you walk with Jesus, it's not going to describe you perfectly. You're not going to do it perfect, but it will describe you more and more. You'll be, as you walk with Jesus, as you give yourselves to the things of Jesus, you'll start to do justice more. You'll start to love kindness more. You'll start to be a more humble person. So the question this morning isn't, okay, am I perfectly executing the will of God? The question to ask this morning is what we talked about earlier, the second part. Be known by Jesus. Jesus in verse 23 says, then I, will plainly tell, uh, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. As you sit here this morning, the question to ponder is this. Does Jesus know me? Does Jesus know me? Here's a good way to think about it. On that day, what is that face-to-face going to be like for you and Jesus? Is it going to seem like a reunion of old friends who've maybe just been separated? Is it going to be like that? Like, oh my gosh, we talk all the time. We just, we live kind of different places. We're far apart. But I talk to him. I know him. I know his ways. Oh, yes. Finally, face-to-face. Oh, this is great. Or is it going to be like, have you ever had one of those socially awkward moments where you're, you, you're at a party, you're at the mall, you're somewhere shopping, you see someone from across the way. You're like, oh, that's, you know, Bob that I went to high school with. You kind of get through there, you know. You say, hey, Bob, it's me, Jeremy. And Bob looks at you and is like, um, I don't know you. <sighs> I experienced this uh, two summers ago. I went home. Uh, my old high school football coach is coaching our high school again. And I was about uh, maybe, I don't know, 100 pounds thinner than I was uh, when I played high school football. I was a little slimmer and a little better shape. So I go by the locker room to see him, uh, knock on the door. He opens it up, and he looks at me, and he's got no clue. (laughs) He's like, yes? I'm a little pudgier than I was. Uh, I can actually grow a beard, you know, like an adult now. So. But I had to remind him, right? I had to say, hey, it's DeBoard, it's me. And then he's like, oh, my gosh. And then he made a joke about my stomach. He was like, well, you know, maybe you need to start running some more. (laughs) And yeah, so a little awkward in the moment, reconciled. But the scary part is there's that really awkward, weird moment where he doesn't recognize me. And what if there's people in this room right now that you think Jesus is going to recognize you, but he's not. And what are you going to say? Is it going to be, well, I give you all the facts, Jesus, you're God. Um, You can name all the facts, but Jesus is going to say, I don't, I don't know you. We get deceived. We live in a world, in a culture. This is one of the biggest things I, I think, the difference in when I read the Bible. One of the big things. We live in a world that just thinks if you know facts about stuff, then you know it. 
But deep down, we know that's not true, right? Like, I know facts about LeBron James or facts about your favorite celebrity. But if they walked in this room, you wouldn't say, oh, yeah, I know that person. Listen to how the Bible talks about knowing someone. In Genesis chapter 4, parents, explain this one to your kids on the car ride home. Now, the man Adam knew his wife Eve. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Adam knew his wife. And for Eve, the fruit of being known by Adam was she had a child. Now, I'm not uh, saying that's like a one-on-one analogy here with God and us. But I will say, as Matt talked about last week, is there fruit of God knowing you? Is there fruit? High school student, ask yourself. Ask yourself, am I known by Jesus? Not can you know Jesus list the tail of tape, right? Born this day, this way, you know, this length, this read. Like, does he know me in such a way that it's produced fruit of justice, of mercy, of kindness in my life? Here's the good news. Here's the good news. He wants to know you, and he wants to know you this morning. You don't have to wait. You don't have to worry. You don't have to stress. You don't have to think, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen on that day? Instead of showing up and God saying, depart from me, I never knew you, you can show up and God can say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. What's my first step? I don't care if you've never heard the name of Jesus this morning or you're a whatever pastor elder you've been walking with Jesus your whole life. I don't care where you're at this morning. Your first step is simply this. Does Jesus know me? The good news, the best news you're ever going to hear is that literally all it takes for Jesus to know you is for you to make yourself known. That's it. It's not go out and do a bunch of stuff. It's be known by Jesus. How can I do that? Well, you can do that with something that's been called throughout church history as the empty hands of faith. Where you sit there and you say, you know, Jesus, I got nothing. I got nothing. I'm not exercising demons. I'm not praying, preaching sermons. I got, I got, I got nothing. The only thing I have is the acknowledgement that I got nothing and that I've made a mess of my life. But I'm here and I want you to help. That's it. That's the step to take this morning. 